Leaders are planning the path forward for 2018, meeting this weekend at Camp David as a budget deadline and potential government shutdown loom. Earlier this week, the president hosted a group of GOP senators at the White House amid efforts to reach a compromise on immigration and border security, efforts the president says he hopes will be bipartisan. We have a, a great spirit going in the Republican Party. I think it can be bipartisan. I hope it's going to be bipartisan. And uh, we can take care of a lot of problems. We can take care of a lot of problems. It would be really nice to do it in a bipartisan way. Joining the panel this week, Wall Street Journal columnist and deputy editor Dan Henninger, editorial page writer Kate Batchelder Odell, and columnist Bill McGurn. So, Bill, let's talk about what the Republicans uh, and the Democrats can get together about. How much do you really think they can do this year? Well, I think they can do a lot. The Democrats have to decide, though, whether their strategy for 2018 is to cooperate with Trump and extract things that they can go back to their base with, like DACA, or whether the dreamers legalizing, those legalizing the young adults. thousand young adults that are here, or whether they're just going to say Donald Trump's the devil and run on that for 2018. But look, Donald Trump is a dealer. I think there's a lot of potential, but each side has to give. You know, the, the president's made it clear he, he'll be willing to go with DACA to legalize these people in exchange for some border security, probably some funding for his wall. So there, there are a lot of doable, there are a lot of doable things. The question is what people are going to give, willing to give for the get. Well, let's talk about that, uh, Kate. Let's talk about the Democrats uh, first and and this choice they face. Uh, do, do they have an incentive to deal, or do they think that resistance, resistance, resistance is working? Yeah, I mean, my theory of this Congress is uh, expect nothing and then be happy if you get one or two discrete things. I mean, there is a question right now about how serious the Democrats are about this deal for Dreamers. They've been saying this week that they're going to hold up the budget process of government funding that already includes a lot of things like children's health care, uh, defense that they spending, want. that they want, right? So there is some question whether they're being politically cynical or whether they do want to get this deal for the Dreamers, which I think there is a natural trade for uh, more, more border security funding for. Well, you know, I think what we're going to see here in 2018 is essentially a scorpion dance, Paul. And there are three scorpions in the pit, the Democratic yeah. Party, the Republican Party, and Donald J. Trump, and they all have their own interest, right? And the baseline here is the elections in November of 2018. The Republicans and Democrats want to know what they can do to enhance their chances of winning in 2018. And so the question does become for Democrats do they resist or do they do a deal? Well, with what do the you think they're going to do? I think they're going to try. I think both parties, I mean, these are politicians, I think they want to run on something. And so I think they'll find a way to try to do a deal on something, as Bill's suggesting, maybe on the Dreamers. The, the Democrats are under tremendous pressure from their base to do something on the Dreamers. And on the but, Republicans... Go, but not to give up anything for it. That's the thing. The left wants the Dreamer deal, but it doesn't want to give up anything on border security or diff changing the immigration laws, for example, to limit the ability to bring in fa well, adult I, family members. Bill suggested we'll find out what they give to achieve the get. And then, of course, then there, Mitch McConnell is actually talking about perhaps passing Senator uh, Mike Crapo, Republican of Utah, bill that he has to help community banks. Presumably this would fix Dodd-Frank. They're just looking for something they can take out to the voters. And but I, beyond that, I kind of agree with Kate. I think the large stuff that Donald Trump wants to do is going to be very difficult. They have to do a budget. They've got to do that, right, Kate? I mean, so, and uh, I know Paul Ryan wants to get a two-year budget because he wants to bust the budget caps that restrain defense spending and give a defense spending increase. But you need 60 votes for that in the Senate, so the Democrats want to increase defense, uh, excuse me, domestic spending on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis, which means somebody, a lot of people are going to have to swallow things they don't like. Right. I mean, the defense debate is really subject to this odd left-right crossfire in that the left wants dollar-for-dollar dollar parity, even though defense has taken a much bigger hit than discretionary accounts. And it's sort of silly to say that all purposes of government are equal and should be funded by dollar-dollar dollar parity. But there's also on the right a, a group that doesn't want to uh, increase the deficit and worries about runaway spending. And that's also the wrong hill to die on here in this budget debate because we know that 
the threat to the Treasury is from entitlement spending. It's not from discretionary accounts. And on entitlements, Bill, there going to be nothing done on that. Right. I mean, sure. Speaker I mean, Ryan is... Well, he'd like to. He'd like to. But Senator McConnell has Senate. said this is this is unlikely. So uh, we're probably going to see some stalemate on on anything uh, big like that. Look, I think one difference from this time last year is the Obamacare repeal debacle taught Donald Trump, I think, two things. One is all presidents learn that even if their party has both houses, they don't work for you, right? <laughs> they have their own agendas. They don't work for you. Um, and yet, number two, a lot of the president's fate will be decided by what gets done or doesn't get done in Congress. So, it, you know, if you see the transition from the Obamacare repeal to the tax cuts, uh, you know, a change in how the White House treated that. And, you know, the one big issue we haven't mentioned here is infrastructure, which the president really wants. I think the Democrats are going to use infrastructure as a wedge issue against the Republicans because the Republicans don't want to spend just public money. And I think the Democrats are going to say, how can you be against anything as pure as spending on infrastructure? Anything on health care likely to come out of this, uh, Kate? Uh, Another round of uh, attempt to do something on Obamacare? The short answer is no, and the long answer is no. But <laughs> I would add to what Dan said, too, that if Democrats uh, refuse to play ball on infrastructure, they might end up hurting themselves because this is an opportunity to spend cash money on stuff that they like. And if it's left to Republicans, they might leverage public-private partnerships, user fees, spending off air con traffic control. They do have good ideas that include the private economy. Okay, all right, still ahead. An explosive new book ignites a war of words between the president and his former chief strategist. What the Trump-Steve Bannon divorce means for Republicans in the 2018 midterms and beyond. An explosive new book igniting a war of words between President Trump and former chief strategist Steve Bannon. In Michael Wolff's Fire and Fury inside the Trump White House, Mr. Bannon disparages the president's family and calls Donald Trump Jr.'s 2016 meeting with a Russian lawyer treasonous and unpatriotic. President Trump wasted no time firing back, releasing a statement Wednesday that read, in part, quote, Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency when he was fired he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Now that he is on his own, Steve is learning that winning isn't as easy as I make it look. Steve had very little to do with our historic victory, yet Steve had everything to do with the loss of a Senate seat in Alabama held for more than 30 years by Republicans. Steve doesn't represent my base. He's only in it for himself. So, Dan, as takedowns go, that's fa fairly thorough. Uh, but what does this book tell us about the Trump White House that we didn't know? Uh, well, it, it tells us something interesting about Steve Bannon and the Trump White House. Steve Bannon purports to be a guy whose goal in life is to drain the swamp. But in fact, it turned out that Steve Bannon was a denizen of the swamp itself in Washington. He played that game in the first six months of the Trump presidency. He clearly was one of the leakers that produced this tsunami of leaks <clears throat> coming out of the Trump White House. Then John Kelly came in and General Kelly, after he was appointed chief of staff, he drained the swamp, and that included Steve Bannon and all the people around him. And since, in the past six months, the Trump White House has been relatively calmer than it was the first six months, and in the past six months, it's begun to achieve things. As calm as you can be with Donald Trump yeah. at the top, a uh, fairly sulfuric personality at the top, <laughs> but, but I, I, you know, the book itself, Kate, is really written, most of it from Bannon's point of view. He, he was the, looks to me to be the leaker in chief, uh, Captain Chaos. He was really one of the big troublemakers there, and, uh, uh, and there was a lot of dysfunction in that six-month period. That's true. I mean, Mitch McConnell said this week, I'd like to associate myself with what the president said about Bannon, and <laughs> so would I, um, because the, what Trump said was exactly right in how the media and Steve Bannon were depending on each other and that Steve was leaking to the press and they were just obsessed with writing about whatever he would, he would say. Um, so I think that is a, uh, Trump is exactly right. So why did he keep him so long? 
Well, I mean, I think that, that Bannon had this uh, personality that some of Trump's voters found attractive. And Bannon did say a lot of things about draining the swamp that uh, were were attractive to people. And he was seen as an outsider, as somebody who, who wasn't part of that culture, even though he turned out to be. So keep him inside the tent, Bill, as opposed right. to outside for right. a while. But he, then he, he just became too much of a trouble. Yeah, he, and also he wasn't there he wasn't there that long if you right. think about it and he didn't seem to have any particular portfolio remember dan mentioned general kelly how how he got fired general kelly comes in to to put some order and to stop unauthorized contact with the press and steve bannon basically directly crossed him by calling up a reporter trashing all his colleagues in the white house and doing it on the record i mean you can't no no white house could tolerate so directly that. defying kelly the new chief who then and then the, he was fired right i i think also fundamentally there is there's always a tension between trump and bannon in the sense that um, by temperament, I think Bannon is more of a declinist, and Trump, by temperament, make America great, has little more about. You know, he's always when you saying, say declinist, explain that. What I think mean? he, I think he looks, and I, I think there's some serious questions about the the pressures on the world and the the credibility of the capitalist system, and there are a lot of people struggling, and I I think there are a lot of people that think we've. Our you know, best days are our best days us. are behind we're, we're heading us. down. And I think Donald Trump appealed to people that didn't accept that our best I mean you could disagree with them on policy as as I do in certain areas in trade. I don't think he agreed with that. And I think that uh, Steve Bannon's appeal was always more on that side. I also think he was trying to weave a Trumpian overarching philosophy that doesn't exist. It's a series of impulses, some of them very good. What does that mean, Kate? What does this mean for 2018? Bannon was going to run challengers, said he would, to every single Republican incumbent senator except for Ted Cruz in Texas. Right. I mean, the only way to read Bannon's firing is that it was intentional on his part, that he called up this reporter and basically tried to get himself fired so that he could go out and run against uh, people he deemed as part of the establishment. So I think one thing this means is that it is a better outlook for Republicans in the Senate majority in 2018, because uh, they still have difficulties and there is a lot of excitement on the left but for instance Bannon has some really bad ideas like challenging John Barrasso of Wyoming who is conservative on all the evidence and has done a lot of great work on Obamacare and now the GOP won't have to spend money on that safe seat and can play elsewhere but didn't yeah. Bannon's uh, strength is perceived influence come from his association mainly with Donald Trump I mean he works for a website that frankly mm -hmm. doesn't have all that much influence yeah well that's right and I think what what has happened here is that Bannonism has just died. Steve Bannon famously said when he was coming into this presidency, the Trump White House is the house of Tudor and I am its Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell sent a lot of people to the block until Henry VIII sent Cromwell to the block. <laughs> and that's what Trump has just done to Steve Bannon. I think he's over. Do you? You really think he's no. over? All right. Okay. He said he might run for president in 2020, you know. I mean, uh, you never know. When we come back, as anti-government protests continue this week across Iran, a look at the Trump administration's response and the Obama illusions shattered. Protests continued this week in Iran as tens of thousands of demonstrators took to the streets of Tehran and other cities across the country in the largest outpouring of government opposition since the 2009 presidential elections there. President Trump tweeting his support for the protesters on Tuesday, saying, quote, the people of Iran are finally acting against the brutal and corrupt Iranian regime. All of the money that President Obama so foolishly gave them went into terrorism and into their pockets. The people have little food, big inflation, and no human rights. The U.S. is watching. Um, Sarin is the managing director at the Israel Project and a noted Iran watcher. So welcome. Thank you. So how much of a threat to the rulers in Iran are these protests, or are they likely to fizzle out? You know, the protesters face overwhelming odds. Uh, the consensus is probably that this round will not be the round that brings down the regime. But what's happening right now is you're seeing economic uh, economic complaints and economic inequality, disparities and so on. Uh, people not having food, like the president said, being channeled into political complaints and political requests and political grievances. So this is different in two th than 2009, which was yep. mainly political. Yeah, it started off different. Listen, <clears throat> economic dissatisfaction it underlies all protests, right? It, it's sure. an, it necessary but not sufficient. Uh, 
these protests began in different places by different people than before. It is uh, people who are hungry and unemployed marching in the streets and the regime made a mistake. The regime immediately treated it as a uh, political issue, not an economic issue. And we saw they came down on the protesters right. and they made it a political issue. And now they face a problem, which is they can't solve the underlying economic disparities because the regime is corrupt and because it spends its money on terrorism. And that now is a political issue. One of the things that you heard in all these demonstrations is complaints about foreign adventurism. Yep. Money to Syria. Yep. Uh, money to Hezbollah. Well, we were supposed to get money from the nuclear deal to help Iran, and instead it's going for the Iranian yep. Revolutionary Guard Corps. That's a pretty potent theme. It's an incredibly potent theme, and it's, it shouldn't have happened. You know, Paul, they, when the nuclear deal was sold in 2015, the Obama administration told us that the regime would spend its money on guns, on butter and roads, not on guns. That, that and, was explicit. The, and, the administration said that many times. In as many words. In fact, they sent people out to say it. Uh, that was never going to be true. And now the Obama guys are saying, well, you see, we unmasked the regime. But that's not exactly what happened. What happened is it's the latest excuse, it's the latest rallying point, not excuse, it's the latest rallying point for Iranians to say, listen, we're not seeing a penny of anything, and these cycles are going to, are likely to continue uh, spiraling downward. So when you say cycles spiraling downward, you think maybe this round will fizzle out, yeah. but then you'll find it erupting, you think, in the future for... Yeah. some other flashpoint. I think that as long as the regime is unable to take care of its uh, dispossessed, as long as the regime is unable to get food on people's tables, uh, you will see cycles of dissatisfaction because the economic issues have now become political. And the regime will be unable to do it because this is a regime that's committed to exporting the revolution at all costs. It's committed to military adventurism at all costs. There is no, uh, it is what they want to spend money on. And so, yeah, I think you're going to continue getting. Uh, a lot of unrest. Well, look, just step back for a second. If you were the regime and you saw that you were in trouble like this, yeah. okay, and you said, you know, we need domestically to do something about this, could they possibly pull back from Syria? Could they pull back sure. from Yemen? Could they stop funding uh, uh, Shiite militias in Iraq, for example? Would that be possible politically for and, and have them survive? It's an interesting question. Politically, yeah, they could probably do it politically. The problem is ideologically, they probably couldn't do it. But it's an interesting point that you're making. When when you say ideological Logically, why not? Because this is a regime that's committed to expansion. This is a revolutionary regime. You know, we don't to see many like Shiite these. millennialism, yeah. basically, and not, expansionism. Not just Shiite millennialism, but also old school expansionism. This is a regime that is committed to exporting the Islamic Revolution. The people who run it are committed, and the IRGC is especially committed. And yet, Ro Ro Gorect and other people who watch things inside Iran say yeah. that the public itself is becoming increasingly secular. It yeah. doesn't share many of the, the, the mosques aren't filled. That's right. I mean, in the mosque, in fact, are a lot like European churches. Nobody goes into them anymore. That's right. that's right. So if that's the case, then you don't have that ideological fervor, that revolutionary fervor with the public. But you do with the people who are running it, which gets to exactly what you were saying. The idea that this is not a regime that is ideologically capable of realigning itself with its population. But, you know, you make an interesting point. We may think that, we may assess that this regime cannot pull back from Iraq, cannot pull back from Yemen, but uh, if you're uh, Iraqis, if you're the Houthis, if you're Hezbollah, you got to be worried that they will. you got to be worried that they turn inward. And it's an opportunity for the United States to begin looking at this situation and going to uh, some folks who are on the bubble in the Middle East and saying, like, listen, this regime is going to have to pull back if it's going to survive. How sure are you that they're not going to pull back? And making them pay a higher cost for their adventurism That's right. by further greater resistance, arming some of the op opponents, for example, in, That's right. in Syria. Can we also do something we don't have a lot of time, but can we also do something to help communications inside Iran? The opposition, they shut down the internet, the government did, or Telegram, this internet yep. popular uh, uh, service. Can we help them get around that firewall? Uh, we have the tech. I mean, we have uh, we have plans on the shelf ostensibly to help them, but it's, a, it's the right way of beginning to ask this question. What can the administration do to help protesters? And they're looking at a range of things. The uh, administration officials are talking to journalists and are briefing people about everything from their efforts to increase communication 
communications technology to upping their game on digital diplomacy to trying to make sure that information gets there, is created, and gets through there, in addition to more punitive measures that they're going to start investigating. All right, Amri, Sharon, thank you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Still ahead, a new year and a new set of global challenges. So how should the Trump administration respond to the protests in Iran and Kim Jong-un's latest nuclear threat? Our panel weighs in next. The new year already bringing some new foreign policy challenges for the Trump administration as Iranian leaders scramble to crack down on anti-government protests there this week. North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un used his New Year's Day address to issue fresh threats to the United States, warning that a nuclear button is always on his desk. President Trump responded in a tweet saying, quote, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I, too, have a nuclear button, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button <laughs> works. We're back with Dan Henninger and Bill McGurn and Wall Street Journal editorial board member Mary Kissel. So let's start with Iran. Uh, Mary, you heard Omri Sarin. Uh, what about the U.S. response to Iranian protests? Trump contrast his response with President Obama's. Uh, it's uh, 180 degrees different, Paul. Back in 2009, President Obama waited to say anything in support of the protesters of the Green Revolution. Meanwhile, the regime rounded them all up, shot several of them, tortured them, and it was over. This time around, completely different response. We've had strong statements, multiple statements, from the President, the Vice President, uh, UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, the State Department, Rex Tillerson's people as well. Uh, so that's terrific, Paul. And, you know, this matters to the protesters. They hear it when the President of the United States says, we support you, and we've just also had new sanctions on companies that support ballistic missile development. Not enough, much more to be done. Dan, uh, uh, what about the Democrats and Europe? Uh, because obviously the Europeans want to do a lot of business with Iran in the wake of the sanctions being lifted. What have we heard from those two camps? Well, uh, oddly enough, the most forceful uh, pro statement from the Democrats on behalf of the protesters was from Hillary Clinton. Uh, beyond that, not much at all. And the reason is, and we'll get to the Europeans, for them, Obama's nuclear deal sits at the center of Iran policy. And the uh, Europeans have been terrible in the last week. EU Commissioner for Foreign Affairs Federica Mogherini has said that the nuclear deal is the most important thing. We sort of support the protest. Emmanuel Macron said the same thing, the German foreign minister. You have to understand they have hundreds of millions of dollars of deals they've already committed themselves to in Iran. And they have effectively put themselves on the side of the regime. They won't say that explicitly, but they've been very tepid in supporting uh, the protesters. There. And so the president now has to decide whether he is going to continue uh, with or withdraw the sanctions on Iran, and which effectively would kill the nuclear deal, something the Europeans are completely opposed to. And uh, full marks to Hillary Clinton, but what about the uh, uh, other Democrats? Are we hearing right. many in Congress? Because they're going to be crucial here, because right. as the president on the nuclear deal, he tossed the, the ball into Congress and said, you guys decide whether or not you want to uh, impose new sanctions that would effectively kill the nuclear right. deal. But to get 60 votes, you need Democrats. Yeah. The Democrats' problem is that they have a policy from President Obama the last eight years that, that led to this. Um, and all throughout that, they told us that taking a tough line would just align the people with the regime. And we see the opposite. So all these myths, the, this, this entire um, sandcastle that Ben Rhodes built, you know. The, the uh, Obama uh, spinmeister. Yeah, it's all coming down now. And we see this. There may not be that much that we can do. But um, I think it's very important to support them in what we can. We've had a lot of instances where we didn't support people. You know, in 2009, of course, in Iran, if you remember back in Tiananmen Square, one of the worst things that happened is a few months after President Bush Sr.'s staffers were in Beijing clinking champagne glasses with the regime. I mean, these are symbols, and, but they're important of where we stand, you know, and, and I think there are things we can do, whether it's sanctions, targeted sanctions, helping them communicate, even getting information out. You know, one of the things that they resent are all these mullahs on these charities that don't actually 
do any charitable work except for the guy <laughs> who runs it and publish their assets. Can we do more on the communications front? Yeah, there's an awful lot that we can do. We can help keep Iran's internet free. Unfortunately, you've had some bureaucratic battles between the Broadcasting Board of Governors and the State Department where we're not funding that, te that technology. That should be priority number one. We could be releasing information on the IRGC and regime corruption so that as we keep the internet free, that information can flow throughout Iran. We could loosen the travel ban for democracy advocates and for journalists. We could have more sanctions. We could fast track efforts to broadcast more into Iran. There's a whole host of things that we could do to help these protesters. Dan, let me, let's turn briefly to North Korea. Uh, what did you think of the president's response uh, on the button question? Um, Nuclear uh, button. Let's put it this way. I thought it was imprudent, to tell you the truth. Uh, we're talking about the greatest foreign policy threat that the country faces. The North Koreans probably are close to being able to fasten a nuclear warhead onto a missile. And Trump has his people working round the clock to create a strategy to deal with that. I think the president would be better off if he quieted down on the subject of North L Korea. Flippant, uh, Bill? It's a little flippant. On the other hand, I'd say this. For three decades, the North Koreans have heard all options are on the table. They know all options aren't on the table. You know, remember Nixon, his, his, his approach in Vietnam, the Nixon madman theory, let them, let them respond. It may, it may have an effect on getting through this guy over who's a nut in Pyongyang. Okay, all right. Still ahead with some key deadlines looming. Could 2018 be the year of the Trump trade war? Early 2018 could prove to be the moment of truth for the Trump administration when it comes to its tough talk on trade. In addition to some other key deadlines, negotiations with Mexico and Canada over the North American Free Trade Agreement are set to enter what could be a make or break sixth round later this month in Montreal. And prospects for reaching a deal are said to be slim. John Murphy is the Senior Vice President for International Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Welcome back, uh, Mr. Murphy. Great appreciate your being here. So let, let's start out by just, I want to talk, a, set the stage here. As we enter 2018, you watch the economy closely. My sense is that we have a lot of momentum for business and consumer confidence. Would you? Well, absolutely. The Trump administration can rightly point at 2017 and say this was a year of economic growth, job creation, rising business confidence, stock market records. And that reflects decisions on regulatory reform where the administration has cut barriers to economic growth and on tax reform where we're getting a more competitive tax system. Um, it's interesting to see how that dynamic can be kept going when uh, there's the idea that maybe we're going to be raising barriers to trade and re-regulating parts of the economy through trade. Yeah, okay, so the, now that tees us up here for this trade agenda where there's all, on a multiple fronts, the president has some pretty big decisions to make. He's teed up steel and aluminum potentially for tariffs on imports there. He's got the NAFTA talks, and he's also talking about China and the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, they may do something to hit back at China for intellectual property theft, for example, which I think is a real problem. But again, the question is, what do you do about it? As you look at that whole agenda, where do you think the biggest threats are from a protectionist point of view? So the biggest effects could come really in the NAFTA talks. Uh, Canada and Mexico are by far the largest export markets for made in America manufactured goods, for our farm products. They buy more American manufactured products than the next 10 countries on the list. Wow. And, and American farmers are dependent on these markets. So we need those talks to go well. Modernization makes sense, but some of these poison pill proposals that we've seen would actually incentivize the offshoring of jobs. So we need to get those talks back on track. Now that's, and when you say poison pill, those are American proposals that you're saying are the poison pills, for example, increasing the percentage of sources of origin uh, uh, from an already very high mid 60 percentage to as high as above 80. That's correct. And for the auto sector, which is our largest manufacturing sector and our largest traded goods sector, 
Um, NAFTA has been a huge success. The, the sector is exporting uh, uh, two million more cars than they were uh, before NAFTA. Um, but we have this challenge here with these proposals which would raise the cost of manufacturing here in the United States and in North America and incentivize production overseas. So it's, there isn't a constituency here in the U.S. that would benefit from this. So we need to see that walked back. Okay. Now, regarding China, uh, uh, do you think the administration is going to act on intellectual property? And uh, what do you think they'll do? I think very soon we're going to see the so-called 301 report come out, which is investigating Chinese industrial policies and practices with regard to the forced uh, transfer of technology right. and intellectual property theft. Um, we understand that this report is likely to have a pretty robust finding that the cost of this to U.S. industry has been high, and we at the U.S. Chamber have uh, been saying that for some time. We agree that these Chinese industrial policies need to be confronted. Um, the challenge, though, is what's the remedy? What are you going to do to fix this? Right. You need to find a remedy that's not worse than the disease, that isn't going to lead to a trade war where a lot of sensitive American sectors get get hit and, and caught in the backlash. Yeah, the, the danger is, I guess, that you don't want innocent bystanders, right? If you put in a broad, it hurt. If you put in a, if you put in a broad-based tariff to hit China on a whole slew of, 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 of uh, Chinese goods, the danger is that uh, the users of those goods in the United States, whether they're consumers or businesses, they're the people who suffer. Well, that's absolutely right. And, you know, I recently visited uh, Nebraska and Kansas, and I heard a lot from agricultural interests there that uh, were very enthusiastic about how the Trump administration has opened up the Chinese market recently for beef exports. Right. So there's a lot of potential there. Uh, those are some of the areas where I think we'd see some of the first costs and the losses of what was recently gained. All right. So now, as I look at the administration internally, you got the Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, and Robert Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Rep, both and firmly in the in the uh, anti-free trade camp. Then you have the president himself. You got a couple of key White House advisors. That's a pretty formidable team saying let's really use trade as a as a weapon politically against and economically uh, against other countries. Where the where's the sources uh, on the other side of the debate? Where do you at the chamber try to? Who do you try to influence and work through? I think what we're seeing in recent weeks is um, a, a lot of senators and governors have been speaking out and meeting quietly with the White House. Um, a, a lot of heartland uh, senators from farm states, from industrial states, um, have been making, I think, in a compelling fashion behind the scenes, the case for uh, keeping a steady course on trade, for modernizing NAFTA and not pulling out of it. And similarly from governors. Um, I think at the Republican Governors Convention, Vice President Pence heard a great deal about how dependent a lot of these states are on trade. All right, John Murphy, thanks for being here. This is going to be a crucial debate in 2018. My pleasure. Thanks. When we come back, blue state Democrats gearing up to sue over the Republican tax overhaul. But is there a better way to bring relief to residents of high tax states? Washington has launched an all-out direct attack on New York State's economic future. It is crass, it is ugly, it is divisive, it is partisan legislating, it is an economic civil war. We believe it is illegal, and we will challenge it in court as unconstitutional. We have not yet begun to fight, my friends. That was New York Governor Andrew Cuomo upset about the tax overhaul. Cuomo announced in his State of the State address Wednesday that he'll sue over the law passed by Republicans in Congress and signed by President Trump last month. Democrats in high tax states are scrambling to blunt the impact of the bill, which limits the federal deduction for state and local taxes to $10,000. We're back with Dan Henninger. Kate Bachelder Odell and Wall Street Journal editorial board member Alicia Finley. So you follow the state tax debate, Alicia. Uh, how are the high tax state politicians responding to tax reform? Are they all like Governor Cuomo? I think that's exactly right. That's what you're seeing. The New Jersey elected governor, Phil Murphy, is taking the same position. They're threatening to sue Jerry Brown. It's a lot of over the top rhetoric um, and a lot of lack of substance. Well, let's take what they're responding, what they're saying. They're going to 
<clears throat> okay, they're going to sue the federal government. Supposedly. But so wh what do you make of that argument? What, well, what's first, they're, they're saying that this discriminates <clears throat> against New Yorkers. Uh, first of all, it actually does just the opposite. Before the tax code uh, favored New Yorkers and other high-tax states. Um, they're also claiming that this is double taxation, but actually, uh, you know, double taxation has always existed. New York actually taxes federal AGI. This right. is no different. Well, and also the New York state can then the federal tax reform, the new one, doesn't discriminate against the states in the sense that it, no, it gives it, it, different laws for different states. In fact, Everybody gets every, 10000 bucks. That's exactly right, and especially because it considers property and state and local income taxes. So it doesn't matter if you live in Texas or New York, you're treated the same. All right, Kate, okay, we've got this uh, payroll tax gambit. They're going to say maybe we're going to reduce income taxes, but then somehow raise payroll taxes on business as substitute? Right. I mean, first of all, on Cuomo, uh, we have not yet begun to fight. Did one of his speechwriters just go see Darkest Hour about Churchill? I mean, it's an incredible, uh, per it's an incredible gap between reality and rhetoric here. But I mean, states are looking for anything they can to avoid having to reform their spending and their pension issues because uh, they can't afford these liabilities that they've promised. So they will try payroll taxes. They'll try any number of tax credit schemes to avoid having to reform the issues that make them out of money. And, and the idea is in pay, the payroll tax swap is that that would, would be deductible. I would actually support a payroll tax swap, actually, because you would <clears> be t it would actually be flat. It would not be progressive scheme. And oh, it also wouldn't you think touch so? Tax. Well, that's how <laughs> would, uh, maybe they try to get around that, but I think the IRS would uh, raise some questions. Don't you think they try to structure it in a way that said, we're going to raise the payroll tax on higher uh, compensated employees? That's the gambit they might pull. Supposedly, they'd probably try to put some kind of excise tax on above income above that but then is that going to be deductible well the irs will consider that federal deductible on federal taxes this all basically sounds like good news to me paul i mean the bottom line is the status quo in these blue states will not hold they have to do something about it the status quo was that for perhaps the last 30 years at least they have gradually ratcheted up <clears throat> taxes on their own citizens to the point where people were beginning to leave these states at the margin the wealthiest uh, taxpayers in places like new york connecticut and california were migrating out now they've got the blow of losing this deduction and they're going to have to respond to it some way and perhaps it'll be a payroll tax but they'll have to work through the system maybe something more rational will emerge so it's a big galvanizing event politically in these states, they're not going to be able to sit still. I mean, that's what I hear from Cuomo saying, you know what, I'm well, afraid all these people are going to leave my state. I that think that's right, but they're also setting this up. Cuomo's facing a $4 billion budget deficit this year. He's setting this up to blame Trump. And that's what all the governors are trying to do when they start facing deficits, um, not necessarily because of this, but just slow growth, slow income growth. They're going to blame Trump. All right. Uh, let's step back and look at the tax reform more broadly, Kate. Uh, what's the reaction here been in the last uh, two, three weeks? It looks like uh, a lot of corporations have responded with bonuses and, uh, and, uh, and raises uh, for people. But Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, Republican who voted for it, nonetheless says he has some regrets. Why? Well, I mean, sure, this is not helpful, right, for Marco Rubio to give an interview, basically making it harder for his colleagues to defend a tax what did he bill say? they all vote for. Um, what he said is that we probably went too far in helping corporations. And set aside for the moment that you help people by letting them keep their more of the money that they earn, right? Um, but what's really frustrating about this kind of discussion from Rubio is that he really uh, understands how the economy grows in, in, on immigration, for instance, about how um, immigration is a net benefit to the country and the economy. He can make that case, but then there's this disconnect on tax policy, and he makes it all a class warfare, taking from other people and giving to others. Sounds like a more democratic... Uh, right, it's exactly the wow. divide we see on the left. I actually think he actually does know better, and this is just very politically cynical ploy. Uh, all right, thank you all. We have to take <laughs> one more break. When we come back, hits and misses of the week.
Time now for our hits and misses of the week. Mary. I wanted to give a big hit to Attorney General Jeff Sessions for rolling back President Obama's policies to go lightly on some forms of marijuana enforcement, to which I say high time. Uh, politicians from Colorado and California may be tripping out, but the right way to legalize pot is to do it through Congress and the constitutional way, not through selective enforcement of the law. All right. Right, uh, Alicia. This is a miss to California. Once upon a time, if a mountain lion attacked your dog or your goat in your, the backyard, uh, you were able to obtain a permit to kill or shoot it. Now you have to use non-lethal methods to try to shoo away the mountain lion because they're concerned about the genetic diversity of the mountain lion population. What do you use, a broom? I mean, yeah, but <laughs> maybe a blowhorn. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Dan. I don't know if I can top that. But I'm going to try to give a <laughs> miss to um, the progressive Democrats who uh, this New Year's Day, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont was standing on the steps of New York City's City Hall in Arctic temperatures, swearing in Mayor Bill de Blasio. Bill de Blasio said he would like to turn New York into the most progressive city in the country. We already know that Bernie Sanders wants to make the United States the most progressive country in the world. But I can't wait until these two progressive saints start.